from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Coming up on Ag Day, working out with goats. It's a lot more about the goats than it is about the Pilates. Why more people are adding them to their routine. This does raise the concern that we are in a bit of a race between corn and soybeans reaching full maturity and the first freeze of the season. As we turn the calendar to September, concerns grow about when that first frost will hit. And the president promises something to help U.S. ethanol. Could a deal with Brazil be part of it? Ag Day, presented by the all-new Chevy Silverado, the strongest, most advanced Silverado ever. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Ethanol industry leaders and farmers are waiting to hear if President Trump will announce plans to help the ethanol industry. That's after he announced on Twitter last week a giant ethanol package would be coming. Ag Day's Betsy Jibben joins us from the newsroom. Betsy, part of that announcement may involve Brazil. Yeah, Clinton, the Renewable Fuels Association says they've heard rumblings and rumors of what this package may entail, but they don't know when it's going to be released. However, the president announcing on Twitter about U.S. ethanol exports to Brazil, but RFA says they are not sold, and overall it's disappointing news. Brazil is increasing the quota cap for ethanol, allowing more U.S. ethanol imports to the country tariff-free before enacting a 20% tariff on the U.S. News the Renewable Fuels Association says is not promising. We don't see it as a positive step. Uh, we were hoping for the altogether elimination of, of the tariff in Brazil. Brazil will soon let the U.S. export nearly 200 million gallons to the country tariff-free for one year. Any more will have a 20% tariff. Previously, the tariff-free quota was nearly 160 million gallons of ethanol annually for two years. President Trump praising the news on Twitter over the weekend, not mentioning a tariff after amounts are reached. In 2018, we exported almost 500 million gallons of ethanol to Brazil. So you can see we were well in excess of that duty-free quota. And so, you know, we had more than half of our, our volume going to Brazil paying that 20% tariff. RFA was hopeful Brazil would eliminate tariffs altogether since they expired over the weekend. But that's not what happened. We've already, through the first six months of 2019, exported 220 million gallons of ethanol to Brazil. So just through the first half of the year, we've already exceeded this new higher tariff-free quota. The news comes during a time when their Environmental Protection Agency granted 31 small refinery waivers to companies who claim they don't have the resources to blend ethanol at certain locations, leaving corn and soybean farmers upset. And I think we got to stand up for our business right now, and every farmer needs to play a role in that. Cooper says if the 31 small refinery waiver exemption still stands, he wants those gallons to be redistributed to other locations which are able to blend that amount. He said that needs to happen so more ethanol plants don't shut down. Clinton? All right, thanks, Betsy. Wall Street and the commodity markets will be looking for positive news today after dropping yesterday following new U.S. tariffs on Chinese imports that took effect over the holiday weekend. Diving into the numbers, the average tariff on Chinese goods is now over 21 percent. That's compared to 3.1 percent when President Trump took office. Now, one of the hardest hit U.S. products of the trade war, U.S. soybeans. Soybean exports to China were 1.32 billion bushels in 2016 to 2017 and 485 million in the 18 to 19 year after the tariffs and due to African swine fever reducing China's appetite for feed. Now, in 2016-17, exports to China were 61% of total U.S. exports. That's now declined to 27.8%. China had been Louisiana's top export market until the trade war started. That's according to statistics provided to the Associated Press by Louisiana Economic Development. Louisiana crop farmer Carl Newton says grains like wheat, corn, and soybeans have been floundering in the state for years. He says that's due largely to overproduction, saturated markets, adverse weather conditions, and crop diseases. Now, many are turning to sugar cane. Newton says sugar is looking more attractive to many farmers because the federal price support program keeps prices of domestic raw sugar above prices for imports. And so, yes, we change and adapt. This is a factory, this, this land. 
and we're going to change and adapt and grow what we can make, what makes the most sense in a, a sustainable, environmental friendly way best we can. I mean, and right generation, now sugar. and right now it's sugar here, and uh, the one nice thing about sugar, we don't have to deal with the geopolitical risk with currency devaluations and uh, the politics with tariff. This year, some farmers are planting sugar cane into more northern reaches of the state where it's never been planted before. Newton says that's happening as grain crops, rice, even cotton are leaving many farmers just breaking even. Farmers expect trade to continue to be an issue in 2020. That's according to the latest Ag Economy Barometer from Purdue and the CME Group. According to its August survey of 400 producers, 58% of those asked expect another MFP payment for the 2020 crop year. That longer term view of the trade war with China pushing August sentiments lower. The Ag Economy Barometer dropping to 124 from its July high of 153. The survey indicating a less positive outlook due in part to crop and livestock price declines, larger than expected crop production estimates and improving overall growing conditions. 71% of the farmers in our August survey said that the 2019 MFP program payments relieved their concerns about farm income here in 2019. However, 29% of the producers in our survey said that they were not at all relieved by the fact that they were receiving MFP program payments. Still, surveyors found 72% of farmers polled say they expect the trade dispute to be resolved in a way that favors U.S. agriculture. Concerns for producers also lie with this year's crop and if the weather will hold out for harvest. The big issue right now, the possibility of an early frost for crops that were planted late due to the wet spring. Since late July, meteorologists at USDA say we've been experiencing near or below normal Midwestern temperatures and that has further delayed crop development. In fact, we're at a record slow development pace right now for soybeans. This is the first time since the mid 90s that we've seen fewer than 80% of the soybeans setting pods by the end of August. And long term forecasts for September continue to put temperatures near or below average. If we continue to see these near or below normal temperatures as expected, we will be racing the clock a bit. And so if we get uh, some cool air masses dipping down that bring in earlier than normal freeze, that is a big concern, particularly across the upper Midwest, that we will nip some of the corn and soybeans before they do reach full maturity. Rippey says even the crops that do reach maturity might have a higher moisture content and there may be an additional expense for farmers in drying them out for storing or before they can be shipped off. Despite the concern about an early frost, it's still t-shirt and shorts weather in parts of the country. As meteorologist Cindy Clausen shows us today's crop comments. Well, Clinton, school's back in session for most students now, but there's still time to have a little fun outside. Kobe of Kansas sharing this video on Twitter. Kobe taking this video of his son testing the limits of that John Deere pedal tractor, saying, quote, when you have too much torque and not enough weight on the front end, no one was hurt in the making of this video. All right, let's take a look at the wind speed forecast for the day today. Really, the focus is going to be on the southeast, especially Florida, as we watch and see how Dorian is going to be behaving. We're also going to have some fairly windy conditions in southern Texas as we watch to see what Fernan is doing. Otherwise, in other parts of the country, parts of the northeast will be kind of breezy today as well as in the central and northern plains. Things quiet down for most areas except for the southeast in the overnight hours. You see those winds picking up now into the Carolinas. That continues into Thursday as uh, Dorian starts to head up into the mid-Atlantic. So we will really kind of keep an eye on that. I'll have your national forecast coming up in just a few minutes. Introducing Farm Journal TV, on demand 24-7, Ag Day, Machine Repeat TV, U.S. Farm Report on your phone and tablet. Download the Farm Journal TV mobile app today. Crop Tour found short soybeans with fewer pods in 2019, so what's the chance that rain and more time can raise yields? We asked that question in today's analysis. That's next. And later, getting in a little exercise with goats. Yes, it's a thing, and it's popular too. You can see why. Closed captioning is brought to you by BASF. Grow smart with BASF. We create chemistry.
been in the works for years, but the Costco poultry plant in Fremont, Nebraska is about to open. The plant is scheduled to open next Monday. It's estimated it will provide Costco with 2 million chickens each week. It will be run by Lincoln Premium Poultry, which says it will be a 45 week ramp up period before the plant goes into full production. A grand opening celebration is planned for October 19th. Chip Nellinger, Blue Reef Agri-Marketing, our guest today. Uh, Chip, as we went out on crop tour, I was out on the eastern leg and we saw a lot of really short soybeans and we saw soybeans still blooming. And of course, part of that talk is, well, how much more can these things fill? Where, where will it take us? What do you think? Well, I think that uh, the market's maybe missing it a little bit uh, okay. from the standpoint of agronomically, and I'm not an agronomist, okay, so yeah. we could get some hate mail from this, but, <laughs> um, you know, we're essentially knocking on the door here in a, in a couple days of September 1st. Um, I think that those blooms are nothing. They're not going to fill out into anything. We've had some rain across, the, you know, some sure. of the dry areas of the Midwest, and that will help fill out what's there, but I think that uh, the people thinking that all these blooms are going to turn into more pods uh, really aren't uh, based in reality right now. And as you cut down, especially the Eastern Corn Belt, pot counts were 20 to 30% oh, below yeah. a year ago. And to me, that just goes right to the bottom line of yield. I think where we were getting 75 and 80 bushel beans last year, we're gonna be getting a lot of 50 and 55s and you know some that could be under 50. Yeah, how does that production number ultimately here for the US, how does that end up weighing into this kind of carryover in stocks and where does that put us in that window? Yeah, there's a lot of focus here on the lack of a Chinese trade agreement and, and the lack of demand there. Um, and that is true, there's, there's no denying that. But some of that demand's already been taken out of the balance sheet. So if, um, under my scenario, that we do have lower to go in bean yields and kind of get into the 43, 44 bushel range eventually, that's gonna cut the carryout down 500 million or below. Just keep in mind, it was three, four months ago, we were expecting a billion plus carryout. So that's not a $12 bean number, but what it does say is, puts a little more uncertainty and, and a little more emphasis on um, Brazil and Argentina growing a big crop, a lot of uncertainty with their growing season, their planting season and growing window there. And so there's a lot of uncertainties in beans. I think we've kind of factored in the worst case. And in my mind, by the J final January report, we've got three to four bushels lower to cut in bean yields before it's said and done. All right, so much left to do with this year, even though we're almost to September. Appreciate and it. And we got to beat a frost too. Well, so absolutely. we're not even talking about that yet. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate it, Chip. Thank you. We'll be back with more Ag Day coming up in just a minute. Farming has changed. Markets are riskier than ever. For customized, focused commodity marketing, contact Chip Nellinger or Adam Dreyer at 309-550-7213. Join Andrew McRae for Farming the Countryside, a farmer-focused podcast that is all about production agriculture. Farming the Countryside is available wherever you listen to your favorite podcast and is brought to you by Nutrien Ag Solutions, the world's largest provider of crop inputs and services. Here with meteorologist Cindy Clausen looking at, uh, well, really a couple of tropical storms that are brewing in the southern part of the U.S. We know about Dorian, but now another one to worry about. Yeah, now we have Fernan, and that is going to be affecting mostly northern Mexico, but that rain and the wind is going to be creeping into the southern part of Texas as well. So that's another thing to watch. Obviously, uh, the big focus will be on Dorian, though, and you can see that skirting along the Florida coast as we head through the day today, and that's going to be heading up to the northeast. Let's put everything in motion here and you can see how our model is showing Dorian moving up, kind of just skirting along the Florida coast. But then what it does is it kind of starts bringing it in and let the center, but you really start to see a lot of rain, especially in the Carolinas as that pushes to the north. Meanwhile, in other parts of the country, we have a cold front that's going to be affecting parts of the northeast. We'll see some scattered showers and thunderstorms along that front in the nation's midsection. High pressure kind of keeping things dry towards the Great Lakes area and we'll have some scattered activity out in the west. Here is Fernan, so that's going to be bringing a lot of rain to parts of northern Mexico and perhaps even into Texas as well. Then as we get to the overnight hours, you can see how Dorian really starts to creep up into the Carolinas. While the center may stay offshore, we're going to be really looking at some pretty uh, pretty high impacts there. Not only storm surge, very heavy rainfall, but we're going to have some very strong winds battering the Carolinas for a while. The front 
The cold front has trouble moving to the east, obviously because of Dorian. Eventually they will merge and Dorian will then move on off to the northeast. We'll watch another front coming in from Canada and we've got some scattered activity out in the west as well. Precipitation wise, it's really going to be those two tropical systems where we see the most where you have Dorian that's going to be affecting folks in the southeast coast and then there you can see uh, what we see from Fernan, mostly in northern Mexico, but the southern tip of Texas seeing some of that rain as well. Here's a look at temperatures very warm along the Gulf Coast states. It's much cooler behind that front in the north central United States. Overnight we go and we see those temperatures dipping down into the 40s and 50s. So the cool spot right here in the Great Lakes, a lot of 70s and even some 80s along the southern tier of states. And then as we get into tomorrow, we'll see uh, some Slightly cooler temperatures getting into parts of the southeast. Still a lot of 90s though, right along the Gulf Coast states. 60s as you get up into the northeast and into the northwest. Quick check of the jet stream is going to show that we still have this ridge in the west. We've got a trough in the east. You can see that trough kind of moves off to the northeast, but but we're going to see that kind of rebuild itself into next week. Ridge will start to move across the country early next week with a little bit of a trough in the early part of the next week in the west as well. That's a look at your national forecast. Now let's check on the weather where you live. Waterville, Washington, plenty of sunshine for you today with a high of 82 degrees. Corning, Iowa, sunny and cooler, high of 77. And Owenton, Kentucky, mostly sunny with a high of 84 degrees. Online shopping has become a thing, but what about online grocery shopping? Some numbers that may surprise you and what the folks at the Packer think is behind them. Next. Closed captioning is brought to you by BASF. Grow smart with BASF. We create chemistry. Do you shop for groceries online? It's a growing trend in the retail industry. A recent Gallup poll shows about 20% of people now do some of their grocery shopping online. Among the people who do grocery shop online, parents were much more likely, along with people who have a household income of $100,000 or more a year. Ashley Nickel of the Packard talking about that with Packard editor Tom Karst. You still have a very small you know, percentage of what, folks using it. Do you think it's the the... I guess sweet spot between income, age, demographic. I mean, what was the, well, anything to say about the to, age? To me, um, to me, convenience seems to kind of be the thread between uh -huh, uh -huh. the groups that are using that. Mm -hmm. So you figure, because um, a lot of the services still cost some money. Right, like right. Walmart, I don't think does. Walmart doesn't have a fee if you go pick it up. Um, mm -hmm. And I know one of our regional grocers here, same kind of deal. As long yeah. as it's $30 or more, there's yeah. no fee if you go pick it up. Yeah. So Ashley said there may also be an awareness issue at play. Usually we'd be telling you about the annual Florida Tomato Conference right now, but it was canceled due to Hurricane Dorian. It was originally supposed to run through Thursday in Naples, but it's being rescheduled. Officials say it would likely be rescheduled for early October. Tomato growers will no doubt have a lot to talk about since the U.S. Commerce Department and Mexican tomato growers finally struck a deal in August for a new tomato suspension agreement. All right, still ahead, need a little exercise? Why goats may make that workout even better next. Your next piece of equipment is on machinerypeat.com. Search equipment from dealerships across the country to find what you're looking for. Only on MachineRepeat.com. There's nothing better for your body than getting a little exercise, and why not give the animals on the farm a bit of a workout too? Check out this Pilates class in Scotland. As you can see, these folks are getting a little help. It comes in the form of Mabel, the pygmy goat. She walks over people's backs like she's following the contours of a rocky mountain path. Now, Mabel is one of the stars of the Pilates class, the first of its kind in Scotland. They're being offered on a farm there. The owner says she was inspired to offer the classes when she visited a goat Pilates class in San Francisco and fell in love with the idea. She says there's a variety of benefits to doing exercises with animals, and it can be therapeutic for people to spend an hour interacting with them. It's a lot more about the goats than it is about the Pilates. So there's obviously, we do a Pilates class, but it's 
the focus is definitely on the goats. So generally they come along and they want to stand on you. So when we're doing plank positions, the goats want to jump on top of you and stand. So it makes your Pilates a little bit more challenging because they weigh around 15 kilos. So it's, uh, it's quite a, a decent sized weight to have on your back whilst you're doing your plank. The goat Pilates classes have to be booked in advance. After the classes, participants can enjoy a hot drink in the garden surrounded by farm animals. That's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in, spent part of your day with us. From all of us here at Ag Day, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day.